So I was out of town last week. And thank you to Susan Powick for preaching. And now I'm back and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my travels because in John's gospel, instead of saying miracles very much, he's talking about signs. So if you go back and look at the 21 verses we read, the word signs is used a lot. And I was focused on signs as I traveled this week. It was my first time to fly since COVID. Are any of you still in that basket of haven't really been on a plane since then? Yes. So that was different. It took a long time to get out of Reno. Maybe that's because people were coming here for vacation and then they got all the smoke. But I was looking at signs like departing gate C31. And I was especially looking for the sign that said on time departure. And I saw that. On the way home, though, I got the sign delayed due to weather out in Denver. But I went to Boston. Have you been to Boston? Uh, they, like a few of our cities that like to have the land and water tours, they have the duck tours where you get on the boat and they, it's pretty gimmicky. They want you to quack and make noise. And, but it's an amphibious vehicle, which is cool because it can go in the St. Charles River and then it can come back onto the land. So I saw the sign that said duck tour leaves at 9 a.m. I was with some pretty hip friends, so we were like, no, we're not doing that. I, I did want to do it, though. Uh, we saw a sign that said the Freedom Trail leads from this marker. And in Boston, if you walk the Freedom Trail, very historical, short walk, there's a, a red line on the bricks. So you don't really get lost at all. You know exactly where to be. I saw the sign that said Fenway Park since 1912. That was cool. I saw the sign that said, don't feed the squirrels in Boston Commons. We toured the Old North Church. Have you heard of that church? An old Episcopal church in Boston and a key place because in the 17th and 18th century, the church was still the meeting house for key things to happen. Whether you were faithful or not, you had to go make an appearance, right? Or if you were a British regular and you wanted to appeal to these uh, conspiracy-minded Americans, then you might go there and show off a bit and show that you're a faithful person too. It's where Paul Revere told the people, light the two lamps at the top of the church if, if they're headed into the inland by sea. And then we'll know one if by land, two if by sea. And then he makes his midnight ride. And in that church, if you've been there, we took a little tour the pews all have signs. It tells you who owned that pew. You had to pay for, and there were like box seats. It was kind of like being at Fenway again, but it was like, it has a door and it said, Captain so-and-so. And then you open the door and there's like four little benches around. And then you could sit and you could watch everything that's going on. I mean, it felt very like separate. Like you're definitely watching, um, which isn't how we want worship to feel these days. And it also felt very separatist, like, this is Captain So-and-So's box. Get out of there. But there were signs, and it was kind of cool to see the history of who had been where and to imagine the preachers that had been in that place. On my trip, we visited western New York then, and even Niagara Falls, and I was glad for signs that told you where to stand if you wanted to get splashed or not get splashed and signs that told you where not to swim because of strong currents or because there's a power plant around the bend that you don't see, but it's not safe to swim here. Any number of things. There are signs everywhere telling us where to go and how to get somewhere and how to live good in the place. Well, John, the gospel writer, he calls what Jesus is doing with people, he says they're signs because they're pointing to something. And it's not just a magic miracle, but there's some deep truth. There's some substance to what's happening with Jesus. And especially John calls it this way because he wants us to consider all the work of Jesus is it's connecting together. It's almost like a connect the dots thing. And if we would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, we would see like a cross or a loving face, or we'd see the face of Jesus. We'd connect the dots, and we'd know this is the Messiah. These are signs of the Messiah. In today's story, the sign is the famous feeding of thousands of people. And notice when Jesus decides to do this or not. You remember when he's tempted in the desert by Satan. Satan says, why don't you turn these stones into bread? 
And that way you could have substance because you're able to do that, right? Prove that you're God. Jesus doesn't do it. But today we see thousands of people are in need. And like Susan so eloquently preached last week, the crowds are waiting. They're trying to draw in. They're maybe just hoping to grab a piece of this person's robe to have a touch of grace with Jesus. And when Jesus sees these crowds, he has compassion And here, he does perform the miracle. He produces the sign. He multiplies five loaves and two fish to provide what not even six months' wages could buy. It's a sign performed in love and for hungry people. It's not a power display or or a coercive kind of move, but it's a heart that is responding to the needs. And the heart has been part of our prayers and our psalm today and all of our readings. Our psalm said, you satisfy the hungry heart. In Ephesians, there was a prayer for inner strength. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, God may grant you to be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. And it's a prayer for a fruitful life because Paul says, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That Christ would make a home and dwell and emanate from our hearts. And then Paul adds, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted in love, that's a whole sermon series right there. You've probably even maybe sat through a sermon series like that. Anyone, a summer sermon series, 14 weeks on rooted in love? We only have today. So get comfortable. Let's go 14 hours on rooted in love. They're laughing, Zoom, so maybe not. I'm going to skip a few pages. Okay, but notice... Notice this blessing of inside and outside faith in the scriptures. It's an inner blessing with ramifications for an outward life, like Jesus handing out food rooted in love. And think of it. It could pertain to the questions and desires and needs in our life, anything we would be seeking after today. We could say, how to live rooted in love. How to parent or grandparent rooted in love. How to work rooted in love. How to grow or change rooted in love. This will be pretty suggestive, but how to be a church counter rooted in love. Or serve on the stewardship committee rooted in love. And I'll let you off with this one. How to say no rooted in love. In today's gospel, it's giving food and nourishment and life to all rooted in love. Like Jesus provides out of compassion for the crowds. And in the beginning was the word, and the word is a word of love for all. And that's where these signs come from. That's why when we celebrate the Eucharist, we lift up this truth with our practice. We say these are the gifts of God for the people of God, and we do it by lifting up bread, giving thanks, breaking it apart, and giving it out to people. And there's enough forgiveness and enough love for everyone. You've even seen our assistants sometimes. We run out of gluten-free, and we just go get more. It multiplies. It's all okay. There's enough here. And then notice in both the Old Testament reading and in the Gospel, that then at the end of this time, there's enough still more to gather up. Jesus says, gather up what's left and let's take it out from here and distribute it even more, which is like in our worship, we would gather up food with shared harvest or we'd gather up love in our hearts or patience or education, any gift that we've been given that we could leave from here and go give to the world. We gather in 
and then we go and distribute. Next week in the gospel, we'll hear Jesus make it abundantly clear that he's doing soul work alongside physical work. So for today, let's just stay with the food and the giving and this bread that's lifted up because he'll say, the bread that's lifted up and broken, that's me for the wholeness of the world. For today, let's see all the giving that's going on. Let's see what's been given to us and what we are entrusted with to give away and that it will be enough for the world God loves. So we chose our hymn of the day weeks ago and it was, I think, mainly Cheryl's choice and I said, oh, I like, I like that song. It, it goes with the reading for today. And then this week when I got back to town, I looked at the hymns and I got into the history of some of them because I want to know where, does, where do these words come from? And I got this blessed synchronicity that I was excited to tell you about. Our hymn of the day that we're about to sing, um, it was picked weeks ago. And then last week I was in Massachusetts and New York. And not to brag, but I was around a lot of water. Have you heard how much it's raining out there? And all the rivers are, they're so different. Like my friend who lives at Niagara Falls said, it never looks like this. There's usually even more rapids. The river is so high that it's like just traveling over the rocks and all these cool and different ways. And it was all the more reason to obey the signs like, don't dive in right here. And it was rainy. And I saw the waterfalls in Ithaca, New York, and um, the Genesee River. Okay, so lots of water. And I pray we get some. So then this week, I look at the worship songs. And the hymn of the day was written in 1877 by Mary Lathbury. And it's a song that tells of the Gospel of John. In John 6, the song says, there's bread and there's life. And the song also connects to John chapter 1 because it says, bless your word of truth. John chapter 1 is where we say, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. Mary Lathbury wrote this song for students that were gathered for learning at Lake Chautauqua. Do you know where that lake is? Western New York, right where I was in the watershed of the Niagara River and the Allegheny River. So this is a pastor behind the scenes moment where I'm like, God, you're too good. You have a, at least a message for me, and I hope it's a song for all of our hearts. So here's what she says. Let, let's get to the truth of the phrases. They are an echo of God's word as a gift that's rooted in love and then becomes a blessing of abundance. So we'll have this phrase, bless your own word of truth, dear Lord to me, as when you blessed the bread by Galilee. Then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, we'll find peace with our all in all. So there's been a synchronicity across the country from New York to Reno and all across this world. And I think all across the text of the scriptures and all across the story of God's church is that we are called by faith, rooted in love, to follow this Messiah who picks up his cross and says, pick up yours too and follow me. And imitate my heart, which overflows with compassion and gives to all in need. Christ, who feeds the hungry multitudes. May you and I bear that fruit of grace as God's word of love takes root again in our hearts today. Amen. Amen.